All right, I think recording's in progress. It, it looks like it is. Hey, everyone, this is Gordon Einstein. Yes, uh, your Dubai resident crypto, blockchain, and other attorney, AI and drones, all that other kind of fun stuff. Um, today, I have a very special guest. I have Kareem Bana on the show. Yes, sir. Um, and I've known him for a while. He's a very smart, innovative, intellectual guy. I'm going to let him describe himself in more depth, but I'm very excited for this guest. So, number one, welcome. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing fantastic. Uh, very blessed to be here and, and excited to have this chat with you. And, and you're also enjoying the Dubai summer weather, yes? Yeah, um, we have a bunch of programs running at the time, so it's uh, it's kind of hard for me to get away. But uh, you get used to it, man. I've been here for four years now. Uh, you get used to it. Yeah, it's not so bad. Okay, let's let's jump right in. What is your business? So we are uh, Brink, which is a venture accelerator, uh, actually headquartered in Hong Kong, but we set up a, a, a setup here in the, in the Middle East in 2016. And we essentially are um, operating and accelerating uh, different programs to help startups kind of grow and find investment. And we help them kind of scale with that. In, in 2021, notably, Animoca Brands invested in us. They uh, We raised $30 million from them, and then we became their platform to support an early stage funding for pre-seed to seed stage Web3 companies. So we've done three cohorts to date, over 50 investments um, in the Web3 space. So that's one part of what we do at Brink. We, we operate other verticals as well. So we have um, in, in Dubai specifically, we, 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 ma we manage the Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund, which is done with the Ministry of Finance and Emirates Development Bank, uh, which is basically helping international companies kind of set up and figure out uh, a go-to-market strategy with the, within the UAE and Dubai. We wow. just are now starting another program with Emirates Development Bank to help Emirati farmers. So in a nutshell, there's a lot of like different verticals that we, we support with, uh, usually in the early stage, which is exciting. On top of that, we have built a network over the past 10 years of amazing mentors and experts and investors um, that we've just kind of held you know, tightly uh, over, the, over the years. And we decided around eight months ago that we would build the Middle East's first and largest mentorship network. So we started building it out. And then in January, we noticed a, a guy by the name of Walid. Uh, he's a serial founder. He started building one in public. <laughs> and when we met with him, it just made sense for us to we call, we acquired Call Me in January. Call Me, okay. and uh, have, yeah, it's Call Me with an I. Um, it's Call Me.co is the website. We have I think close to five hundred uh, investors, experts, mentors already onboarded, which is which is excellent. We're now doing a full content sprint to kind of raise awareness around it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions around what's happening in the Middle East. People are really curious to see what's going on here. Um, and then just trying to blindly go on LinkedIn and, and, and you know, <laughs> to reach reach a lot of these experts is, is tough. I mean, if they even answer or even check their LinkedIn. So we're trying to bridge that gap. And so it's, it's just very easy for you to find um, some top experts like Sharif Al-Badawi, who's the CEO of the Dubai Future Foundation Fund. He's on there and you can book a call with him right away. Um, so there's there's a lot of uh, amazing experts that are onboarding and they're, and we're trying to get more of them on board as well uh, as we as we push as we push forward with this. There's a lot to chew on there. There's a lot to sort of dissect and work through. So let, let me let me hit another vector and then we'll kind of circle back around. So what is your, where, where are you from? I am, uh, my father's Lebanese and my okay. mother is British. Um, I joke that the best gift my mother gave me was a British passport. So uh, uh, officially as a nationality, I am British, although I do not feel British at all. Um, so I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia, okay. <laughs> which is which is interesting. My father's French educated, my mother's British educated, but they decided to put me and my brothers in American schools, which is why I, I have this like Dubai international accent that you kind of hear. Mm -hmm. um, so grew up in Saudi Arabia until I was like 13 years old and then moved to Beirut for high school and university. Um, and then after I graduated from the from the American University of Beirut, I decided to go to London and uh, worked at McKinsey for a bit, got into nice. management consulting, which was not my cup of tea, um, and well, then moved it, to it China. It sounded glamorous, since my reaction. Uh, how long were you at McKinsey? I was at McKinsey for just over a year. And then I was working with uh, someone at McKinsey who decided to start his own 
his own firm where they were basically uh, outsourcing junior analytics, banking analytics to uh, a team in India. So they built this out and I was essentially an executive assistant to this guy, but he was a very high performing CEO. He was, he was incredible. Um, they built the company to like a thousand analysts out of India. And then they were just taking basically instead of a bank hiring someone at a junior level at $40,000 a year, um, they would get uh, folks in India to kind of, you know, do that early, like, you know, initial research uh, analytics. Uh, they ended up selling to Moody's, which was uh, a great experience watching that with them. And then I decided um, to follow my father. And this is where my my story gets kind of weird, <laughs> but gets kind of uh, interesting. I moved to China in 2010, lived there for 10 years. Um, uh, so the first four years, I'd say I was working with my father. He's been in China since the early 80s, set up a factory out there. And I was like, you know what? Young ones, let's just go and 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 see what what it's all about. I was completely impressed. I mean, honestly, well, my again, I am initial... exiting my Telegram because I'm getting beeped all of a sudden, and I want to be with you. So you go to China. <laughs> yeah, went to China. My father's been there since the early '80s. Has a fact. He set up a factory in 2001, and uh, I was like, you know what? Let's just take the leap of faith. My initial uh, feeling was like I I felt like China was in my mind, because I guess of what I've seen on, on TV and stuff is just, it was way behind, but in, in reality, it was way, infrastructure was amazing. Like, uh, you know, the city that I was, I moved to, which was Guangzhou at the time, uh, was incredible. Like they were building so much stuff and it was so fast. Uh, it was really impressive to say the least. And then I just, you know, for the first four years worked with my father and we were manufacturing essentially garments uh, for, for many brands and just trading different things that uh, people were, people who knew that I was in China were asking for different stuff. So, Great experience, learned a lot about what the true cost of things are, <laughs> so uh, which is, I think, a great skill to have. Um, but then I luckily, by fate, just had a lunch once with a couple of Chinese friends and a, an entrepreneur, a Chinese entrepreneur joined that lunch. And he was like, hey, I'm uh, this is back in 2014. And he's like, Tesla was, you know, just was coming up and they're doing great things with the Model S. And he's like, I want to build an electric vehicle brand. And I was like, I laughed. I'm like, I've never in my life heard anyone just kind of like, you know, be that ambitious to say, I want to build a freaking car brand. Okay. So we're just chatting and he's like, but I'm looking for a car designer. And it just happened to be that one of my buddies back in high school, uh, he built the Dubai's first supercar brand called W Motors. I don't know if you've seen this. It was in Fast and Furious 7, the car that jumps out of the Etihad Towers. And okay. so I've seen yeah. my friend kind of build on Instagram. Yeah, I've seen my car, my friend kind of build it on Instagram. Uh, a good following. But the first car that they, they released was a $3 million hypercar, right? So it was like, uh, they were trying to be flashy, put diamonds in the headlights. You know how it is. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With Dubai and that. And that's, I'm like, actually, a friend of mine started building this brand. Showed him the phone. I sh showed him my phone and showed him the car. And he's like, oh, my God, tell this guy to come now. I want to talk to him. I want to bring this brand to China. And I want to I want him to his company to design the car that I have in mind that I really want to do here. I'm like, fine. So I called my buddy. I'm like, listen, you won't believe it. I mean, I'm just chatting with this guy having lunch and he wants to build a freaking electric vehicle brand and he wants to bring your brand to China. You know, usually I take these with a grain of salt, but I'm like, so he, he flies in two two weeks later. And he presents uh, what he's doing. And he says, in 2015, the car is going to be the superstar of Fast and Furious 7. We already shot everything in Atlanta. The fucking the movie is like, it's it's, it's done. Like, it's happening. Right. Um, and uh, it's the, the movie is going to come out April 2015. And so, of course, this Chinese guy now, this multimillionaire, was just <laughs> like, he's like, he hit the jackpot kind of thing. So he's like, um, Kareem, prepare the contracts. Let's get the full rights distribution to uh, ch to China for this for his brand, and let's start uh, planning that, and let's focus on that for the beginning. So we prepared that contract. Three days later, and how, he signed how did you it. Know, signed... I, I gotta ask as lawyer, how did you know how to prepare the contract? No, we we just so the the, the folks here, the, the W Motors guys here, had already a, like a distributor in Miami, so they had a kind of like a an exclusive rights kind of you know you know dealership kind of model. So it's. Uh, they kind of set up that dealership uh, contract to bring that to bring that uh, supercar to to China. Essentially, it was like buy, buy a minimum of two cars, whatever, and then you know what I mean. Like then, you, then you're the official dealer. Like that's okay. that was basically it. <laughs> it was a pretty easy contract. I like, I'm I'm enjoying yeah. the story. Go on. Yeah, it's, I like uh, how it's, life it's, goes it's, all these crazy directions, and you just gotta flow. It, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it's absolutely true. Um, so the guy was like, "Okay, Kareem, you're the CEO of this." Uh, of this dealership, you're gonna run everything from now until April, 2015, we have Shanghai Auto Show coming. 
you have to take care of everything. And, and I was like, I'm still working with my dad and I have two, I have two younger brothers, but my middle brother was basically, uh, uh, was there as well. So I'm like, dad, like, I don't know what to tell you. I love you. Like, this is, you know, I just can't say no to this opportunity. And it, it seems very interesting. And, and, you know, these guys are fine, well financed and all that. So I took the leap of faith. I was like 27 years old at the time. And I was like, fucking hell, like I, we can swear on this or <laughs> is it a censored one? I was like, great, um, let's let's do it. So I, I I joined and I was really excited. We we basically prepared for Shanghai Auto Show and the movie came out like two weeks before the show. I have pictures on my phone that was in, 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 insane. I mean, like this car was a, the star of a movie and now it's like in the middle of Shanghai Auto Show. To put it in perspective, a million people attend this Shanghai Auto Show over a 10 day period. You know, most of Chinese people do their car buying and purchases at this show because you have every all the all the manufacturers are there right all the newest models they come they see every single car that's available and then they'll just tell they'll just introduce them to their local district you know you know what i mean so it's, it's a huge show but anyway so that was that was that was great and uh, we then just, just took it around china and, and i got to travel around the whole country which is uh really cool um and then I mean, in 2016 yeah tell me some yeah, so in, in 2016, we're like, you know what, now's the time to let's build this electric vehicle brand that you had in mind in the beginning. Um, so we, you know, we wanted to do something different. So we're like, why don't we do an electric minivan, a freaking VIP first class minivan, like someone that, you know, drives you around and is going to be ready for like the Kareem's, the Ubers, the, the DDs in China. Uh, while everyone else is building a freaking fast car that's for the driver, why don't we change, switch it up and do something for the passenger? And uh, yeah, they, they love that idea. In China, it's very different. The rich people don't drive themselves, whereas in the Dubai, in Dubai they do, right? There they don't because it's just traffic is ridiculous and finding a parking space is impossible. So they'd rather be driven around. Traffic's um, ridiculous in so Dubai that... too, but yes. <laughs> Going to Marina good. and DIFC, that, I've given up on Marina. I don't do anything in Marina anymore. It's just not worth the, the yeah. headache. Yeah. So uh, we yeah, we built this. We 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 uh, we raised ten million dollars. We built a prototype of this idea that we had in mind. So we built so, so one pause, was like more like, about... you're still working with this successful Chinese entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah. This is all with him. So he's he's the he's the head of all of this. Yeah. Okay. So the 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 raise you had to do was to supplement his investment. The yeah, because we wanted to you no. Know, so we we like most of that investment went into kind of building the brand into uh, for bringing W Motors to to the region to to China, but then yeah, I mean uh, they wanted to raise just to, to to build a proper prototype. I mean the car business is freaking expensive. It's like it's to build to sure. get a car from 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 sketch to to deliver to deliver it is like a billion dollars from A to Z. Like just kind of building out a platform and getting on engineers on board. It takes four years to engineer this thing, which means you have to pay these guys salaries. It's a, uh, it's a really uh, intense, a capital intensive industry, which I, which is what I learned along the way. Um, the story gets, it comes, it, it's up now, but <laughs> it's coming. The crash, okay. the, the, the Wait, look, look. Hey, whether it's, <laughs> every failure is a success because you learn something. I learned something. Absolutely. So, hey, I learned was, a lot. Keep going. The tie to crypto and tie to Web three as well that comes in because uh, I learned a lot from the, from that as well, which is really interesting. So uh, we raised ten million. We build these prototypes on like a freaking Nissan platform. We just strip it down and just kind of put it on top of it, and then we take it to uh, uh, one of the another auto show, and and uh, they love it. Like they're like, oh my god, this is amazing! Like it's a car for the passenger. We put screens in the back. You know, you can recline all this stuff, and we ended up raising two hundred forty million dollars from a um from a sovereign wealth fund from like a, a local area called taizhou at the time and i was one of the first three employees we started hiring some people from like bmw ford jaguar land rover like all these guys were getting bought into this vision of building um a, a car for the passenger which was a, which was really exciting so we built it to 200 people and we we started really like scaling it out in terms of just development no sales obviously but then uh, series b was supposed to be q1 of 2020 and uh, that's when everything just <laughs> started to crash down covid hit and unfortunately we couldn't raise that uh, that at the time and the company kind of spun off and went on a different direction yes. but i was in uh, yeah i was in i was in budapest with my my wife is hungarian so i was in budapest for chinese new year and we just couldn't go back. Like China was like, your visas are all void. You can't come back. Like just oh, deal wow. with it. And so, 
Yeah, so naturally I was like, shit, I'll, co I'll come to I'll come to Dubai because the guys that are designing everything were still based out of here. Um, so I came here, I worked with them. Uh, we when I came also at the same time he was also raising around here uh, because they're building a factory out in Silicon Oasis. Uh, so I worked with with him for about I want to say a year and a half, and then to tying it all back into Web three and crypto during that whole sprint when. Uh, things were going great. In 2017, I got introduced to the whole IPO craze that was happening. And I dabbled here and there. I threw $1,000 at this. I threw $2,000 at that. And I was just so fascinated by how much money these people were raising or these projects were raising on just the white paper. Yes. Um, so I was really, I was really, I became a fanboy. And at the same time, that's when, when Bitcoin hit $20,000. Remember that first, <laughs> that first tulip? That first pump. <laughs> so that first pump, right? And everyone, it was amazing. Like I was the fanboy that was, everyone at the company, I think got into Bitcoin because of me. I was just selling it all the, all the way. Um, and, I, and I got some good hits on, on some of those IPOs. Some of them obviously didn't do well, but some of them did really well. Uh, and just really was fascinated by, you know, it being, it being permissionless, anyone can build. And it was just really an interesting space. Obviously we knew that it was a wild, wild west. And People were getting scammed and it was it was getting bad at, at some point, but sure. I just loved it. I was really fascinated by it. So tying it all back to what we're doing now today with, with Brink and how I joined Brink two years ago um, is I've known the founders of Brink from our times in China. So a very small expat community and, and I've known them there and they were looking for someone to head their Web3, uh, you know, what they're doing, Web3 vertical here. Um, and naturally, uh, they offered me the position and I was super excited to to build it out. And that was the same time Animoca Brands invested into Brink and they really wanted to uh, build that vertical. So it was really exciting. The work I do is fun. I mean, I've been in the startups my entire career. I've been on both sides. Um, I've been fundraising, which when I, when people ask me like what I enjoy doing or what I'm, uh, what I'm good at, it is helping the startups that I'm in either fundraise or help others try to figure out how to become more investor ready. Um, and that's initially that's essentially what I do within the within the group is um, for every program we assess where they how they fundraise where their deck is at um, the structure that they have in place and then kind of get them comfortable with asking all the questions that are going to come from investors right so there's a lot of or kind more of most of responding to all the questions right exactly and most I think most of the decision is made from is is in the Q and A that happens at the end if you watch Shark Tank I think I've watched ninety percent of them. Um, it's it's it is the Q and A at the end. If you can't answer your profit, your top line, your gross margin, if you can't answer any of those right away, like those are things that are just yellow to red flags that might be a problem. So you need to know those on on the on the dot. Anyway, so those those are kind of things that I do, and I get to meet over a hundred different founders every year now with this new uh, this new role. Each one has a different problem. Like each one has a unique you know, flair, and you can right away figure out a, a great founder from one who's who needs more work, let's say. Um, so just overall, very blessed. And then, as I said, now tying back into what we're doing today is uh, uh, the Call Me platform. So we're really putting so all of our network. It's Call Me, like just Call Me. Call Me, okay. Yeah, it's just without the E, it's with an I at the end. Got it. I wanted to call it something else, but it is what it is. And uh, yeah, so we've, we're building that out now. And and it's uh, it's great because it's it's becoming an, a faster way for people to get advice and information that they need. Um, and it's, uh, you know, as as what we do at Brink is more B2B, but now we're trying to really push a more B2C uh, angle and just, as well. And just know, kind when of, they want information about starting and running their company or is it in general? Yeah, so we have also the co-founder of Washman, for example, on the platform. He's the COO in Washman. They raised $10 million. Uh, so if you wanted advice on, you know, th that specific industry, or if you want advice on how to hire someone, or just, you know, just getting insight from someone who's done it, spe specifically in the region, or you just want to speak to someone, maybe you have a laundromat and you're thinking of selling it, right? I mean, these are things that you can just, instead of just going around and trying to, uh, trying to figure out who you can speak with. This is, you know, just go on the website. You can book the time with them right away, have a chat and figure out if there's any synergies there uh, because these guys are all busy, right? And, and and if you want to just go on LinkedIn and do a cold outreach, you can try that, but it's, uh, this is a, a good way to kind of just expedite I it, I would say. Yeah. Cool. So the, I, I like, I like everything you're doing. And then you, you mentioned two or three local government connections or yeah, yeah so with, when you when you look at it go deeper and, and go slower yeah, yeah, that was yeah. fascinating and i want to see how it all connects up absolutely 
Absolutely. So as part of my role as well, obviously, it's business development, and that's kind of getting new programs on board. And um, if you look at a venture, if you look at accelerators in general, I mean, there are a handful of people who buy programs, right? It's going to be either corporate for innovation. Um, it's going to be government entities that really want to boost the ecosystem. So we have been working with Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund uh, for the past three years. And that is in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance and with Emirates Development Bank. Okay, now, um, now so that's a bank. What, what is their specific mandate? So the Emirates Development Bank is the bank for SMEs, essentially small to medium enterprises. They're here to 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 help uh, finance things if you need it, or it's, it's a basically it's an upgraded kind of business account for you know for enterprises that are are medium size and small size, but looking for any kind of support to, you know, if you need cash flow, if you need financing, they're, they're, they're there to help. So the, and on their side, they're trying to bridge um, early stage startups with, you know, traditional, traditional industries as well for manufacturing and so on. Okay. So they're, and then that's, that's their intention. I would say the ministry of finance obviously wants to bring more amazing projects to come and build um, in the UAE, set up a company, build a you know set up a branch here, and 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 all that we call we call that kind of a soft landing uh, program. Mm -hmm. It's just to get more people interested. And and luckily enough, I think you've seen it in the past two three years. Everyone's super interested about UAE and Saudi and and what's going on here. And so I'm here. I make the joke. We have 250 companies in our portfolio right now, and I make the joke that I've become like the virtue zone. <laughs> I've become the Everyone, I get on two, three calls a week from uh, our portfolio saying, "Hey, like, which free zone? I've heard about ADGM. I've heard about DIFC. I've heard about this. What do you, what do you suggest?" Like, and I've just become kind of the guy uh, to help them what, navigate that as well. What do you tend well. to recommend? I know everyone's different, but what, what, what's your? Yeah, I guess. I guess it depends on if you want to set up like a, a holding company to re to to receive investments. Then I would look at ADGM or or DIFC, if that's the case. If you're looking to kind of um, operate. It depends on, so I have, we have I, uh, another thing that we do. I mean, just my personal life, I have, we have an ice cream business. That's an, that's an, that's a mainland license that we do um, because obviously we sell locally to the market here. So if you're depending on who your clients are, if they are within the UAE, then it makes sense to do a mainland license. Um, and then if, if your clients are abroad, then a free zone, any free zone would do. I'm very close with DMCC. So I'm going to plug them in. Uh, DMCC is a fantastic one. Um, I'm in. But they're all. I'm in. Ben <laughs> our friend. <laughs> yeah, man, he's fantastic. By the way, he is absolutely a legend. I want to get him More on one of my. Uh... I don't. I don't know how and he. he all. And he remembers me. I had one meeting with him, and, and I was just sitting downstairs at the common grounds. It was like three months after my first meeting with him, and he remembered me. And he came and he sat down. He's like, "So what's going on?" And I was very down to earth guy. Very, 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 very. Yeah, he's really cool. And his coffee. His coffee is great. Fantastic. Yeah, he gave me a tour of the whole diamond. Uh, I think I saw 1 million, 2 million diamonds in an hour and a half. I told my wife, she's like... <laughs> yeah, that, 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 was, that was your mistake. That was my mistake, yeah. That was your mistake. <laughs> okay, so, there, there, so there's... Maybe you can do, uh, talk about this a little bit. There, there, there seems to be a... This is in the US. There, there's, there seems to be an blurry but effective melding of ruling families government organs and development strategy that mm -hmm. seems to blend and wash back and forth maybe through these initiatives maybe through these accelerators maybe through the individual or family ownership of some public facing bodies I, I find it an interesting hybrid system that seems to work so I'm not being critical of it, but it's different from my Western brain. It is a slightly stronger line between public and private. You know, here it's almost like a kind of a corporatist environment, but I think mm -hmm. if you know how to maneuver through it, you can get some good things out of it. Maybe, first of all, does that question even make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? And maybe you can share your thoughts. I understand, I understand what you're saying, but what's the question in that, in that phrase, in what you're saying? Well, you, as an operator in that environment and one who's doing successfully, what's it like? And then what's 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 a good strategy and what's a not so good strategy? So they are clear on 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 some of the KPIs that they have internally, which is to um, 
let's say with Mohammed bin Rashid Innovation Fund, it is to uh, to support, let's say, 50 startups per year, um, get them, uh, essentially, we give them a, a full team on the ground to help them go to market. So let's say there's a health tech company startup that's building something that helps deaf people or, you know, they built this software, AI, uh, they built a software that kind of uses AI, whatever, they, 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 they've done it. Um, we would then introduce them to Department of Health Authority, we'd introduce them to any ministry that can kind of accelerate um, their 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 push into the market here. So they essentially don't have to hire people on the ground in the UAE. They have a full team of, let's I'll say, five, six people mm -hmm. making sure that they're getting all those introductions. So some of them, how we get measured on our success is uh, we've done like 100 one-on-one um, meetings. We've done 60 workshops, you know, throughout the whole, throughout the cohort. Um, and each, each, each week we do a curriculum. So each week is a different theme. And so that's how, you know, and so those are the kind of the, the KPIs that they're measuring. It's just, it's by numbers, I would say. It's like, how many startups can we get to come set up a company uh, and, and actually have a little bit more chance of success than just saying, come to Dubai, figure it out on your own. Okay, so, but that's just let, one let push on that a little bit. The, um, KPIs are great, but then there's always the issue that people don't necessarily study for the subject. They may study for the test, meaning that, there can be some performance theater, but not yeah. necessarily the outcomes that you're ultimate outcomes you're trying to achieve, because those mm -hmm. are inherently harder to measure. For example, bringing a company here is something you know you you know what they got the license, you know what they're operating. How many jobs they've done? Yeah, how many jobs they've they've given? Right. How many those are all measurable? They're... Yeah, but there's th there's things that are a little bit more amorphous. Like, is it successful? Is it contributing to the ecosystem? Is it partnering is there a silicon valley like ecosystem forming or is everyone in their own little bubble and, and i would imagine mm -hmm. that if asked the governments and public entities would want those outcomes but it's a, it's it's not necessarily saying that's so easily manageable or measurable so i, I see what you're saying how, how do you, how do you wrangle that because that, that's a question that that occurs to me a lot and you're in a position to yeah, yeah. get some insight but I mean, look at you, your WhatsApp group is fascinating. I mean, you 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 make it look easy in setting up a huge ecosystem and huge network, but it's not. I mean, what you've done is is really really uh, go on, uh, go amazing. on, G give me details. How how great am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe it all right ties in, <clears throat> right? I mean, it, maybe it all ties into like the real estate. <laughs> maybe it maybe it ties into the real estate, right? You're seeing people buying properties, moving here, investing in real estate. Maybe that all ties in together. It's like more companies are, are setting up here, more people are buying properties, there's more transactions happening. You know, there's I think that it is a butterfly effect in some in, in some in some way. You know, but there's there's definitely something happening here. You're, you're kind of joking with you, I think, but maybe you're not. I I've I've heard the cliche, and maybe you can comment about I want I want to finish the last topic, but I also want to introduce something else. I've heard the cliche that the at least the older generation here, the older native or Emirati mm -hmm. or whatever, or Arab generation understands things like retail. They understand things like manufacturing. They understand things like yeah. real estate. And so the free zones and DMC, ADGM and DFC included, mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some reputation they have of being a real estate play, which is their right. marketing the commodities exchange, they're marketing the finance, but what they're really trying to do is sell and rent office space. Okay, it, I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's right or wrong. I'm, I'm saying that's part of their public perception. So it's funny you say real estate. I mean, it could be that like bringing, you know, a, a cynical view might be they're bringing all these companies and all their employees just as they want to sell more real estate. They want to sell more villas and condos and apartments. And maybe there is some of that. But I also think that at least the upper leadership of this country does have sort of a futuristic vision of where they want to go. It's just to kind of circle back to the original question. When they're working through these initiatives like the ones you're talking about, and they're, yes, there's doing the meetings, yes, there's the licenses, but is does that really capture the success that they're going for? You understand what I'm asking? This is a very thoughtful pause, my friend. No, sorry, the, the internet just uh, just paused there for a bit, so I was just waiting for you to come back. 
Um, I see what you're saying. I feel like <clears throat> they might be looking at other like other countries doing this. So if you look at Y Combinator in the U.S. and San Francisco, where you know the the reliance on the traditional industries such as real estate, oil, and all that, you're seeing the, the younger generations come in, and you're seeing the top leadership also noticing the, the power of software and and technology companies, right? Where you can really scale them, and you're starting to see success stories like. Uh, Souk and Kareem, uh, Souk and Amazon, sorry, and Kareem being bought by okay. Uber, and you have Jahiz in, in the Middle East. So you're seeing these unicorns that are popping up now. And if you look at Y Combinator and you look at other kind of accelerator programs, um, Airbnb came out of Y Combinator. So there is, uh, there, there, there is a, there is a precedent in success in having accelerators help technology companies get somewhere faster um, through these workshops through these these learnings and through these you know uh, connections that are being made so i feel like there is a push towards software and and most of the all of the companies all of the companies that i'm dealing with in Hamad bin Rashid innovation fund are technology software companies whether it's b2b and do whether they it's ever SaaS. take equity in the companies these public type accelerations no. so this this specific program is equity free which is it's a bonus to some of these start uh, founders right they don't have to dilute which is great um, at the end of the program, um, the Emirates Development Bank, at their own discretion, may give a a loan that is very favorable to so, to support them. And, and do you feel that? So there's there's an there's a. Do you feel with your Brink background? Do you, do you feel that the investor tax equity they may be more aligned, or is it? Yes, you don't. Yes, you don't want to dilute. Of course. That's but a fantastic an question. That happens when the investor takes equity, also. That's a fantastic question. So I say the biggest difference between our operations in Hong Kong and our operations in the Middle East is in Hong Kong we do uh, equity programs, where, for example, let's take Animoca Brands. We'll come back to our Web three uh, topic. Animoca Brands invests off of their balance sheet around one hundred to two hundred fifty thousand US dollars. Okay, and the companies okay. that we look at are usually in the four million to six million dollar kind of valuation. They're at that stage. Yeah. In Web3, it's it's quite <laughs> quite early. But obviously, if there is a company that we really like that's a little bit more, we'll it's it's a case, it's a case by case. So with that program, a lot of these uh startups that do join, they want to be part of the Animoca ecosystem, right? They see the name, they want to be part of that and become part of the uh portfolio. There's a there's a Slack channel with there's like 500 plus uh portfolio companies, all the founders are in there. So there's a network, there's an you know, with with Animoca specifically. Um, so your question to would an equity one be better? I mean, the ones in the, the, the UAE that we're running right now are not equity programs. There is a definite plus to having an equity program um, with an investor if the uh, if there's a, if it's a strategic investment com uh, investor coming into to, to the to that vertical space, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say in this case it's Web three, it's Animoca Brands. Uh, most of these founders are are keen to uh, to give up equity in exchange for the program, but plus being part of the Animoca uh, community. Interesting. Uh, so you're, you're, I think you've done a lot. You've had a very winding road and, and but the VC slash investor slash incubator world seems new wish to you. You obviously worked with the startup with the cars, but you're here working in this world directly for three years and, and you, you seem to know a ton. You seem to have your 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 sea legs. How did you learn, or do you just have native skill for it, or is it just being in the middle of it? You, for someone watching who wants to be you, yeah, you're, where you're their hero, how do they do you? You know what? I I, I love this. Um, I I was thrown in. I became a, I was a program manager for that specific Animoca Brands uh, portfolio. Like I wanted to be. I wanted to like. I wanted to be part of it. So I, I really came in. Um, we had 15 companies per cohort. I would take five and those would become my, like, those are my children. Um, so I worked with them day in and day out to kind of, to, to help them, you know, meet up and, 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 and introduce them to the right partners through a 12 week program. So I really got to learn the ins and outs of kind of, you know, what kind of support they need and all that. Um, and I loved it. And then from there, just. You know, learning how a success it was. A, it's a very successful program. So I learned how a successful program is run virtually, which is also an, an accomplishment, I would say, which is built by the team in Hong Kong, by the way. But but I got to learn that just because of being in it, in it firsthand. 
Um, so that's we have a guy who a colleague of our mine who's he's part of my team. He came in as an intern, okay, about a year ago. He's now program manager. Like this guy was he's a he's an absolute legend because of just being part of it and 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 learning everything. And and what's great about Brink is the the platform and software is that and curriculums that they've built over 10 plus years is really, really top. It's a, it's an amazing curriculum. It is like doing a master's degree, super like condensed within 12 weeks. You end up meeting dozens, if not like at least 50 uh, amazing experts and investors and mentors. And at the end of the program, uh, you get to pitch in front of, I would say 25 investors. And then they actually are engaged and wanna learn more uh, we've had, uh, I think, three or four companies raise a million dollars plus during the program. Wow. Uh, one of them was part of my my team. Uh, they're called supersite.xyz. I'll, pl I'll plug them in. Um, but seeing something like that where you, you, you're you with them in the beginning, they're, they, you know, they, they're trying to raise money. You, you kind of introduce them to the right people. Their, their pitch deck starts to get a little bit more refined. Uh, you see that they're pitching better. They're learning how to be more comfortable. And then at the end, kind of closing a deal and you helping them with the safe notes and helping them with the legal and helping them uh, with all that is, is it's rewarding. Right. And then it's I just, uh, it sounds it's, like it's heaven. A, yeah, it is really cool. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm really blessed to be in this. It's and, and different verticals as well. Honestly, I love the web three and that's, it's, it's, it's an amazing one, but jumping into different verticals as well. It's just like, wow. Like it just opens up your mind to different problems um, that founders are facing. And you're doing all this and you're married and you have kids. I think you, you posted on Instagram, am, so it's out in the open. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, I've, uh, I've known my wife since we were 22. So I'm 38 now, um, wow, we, got married at, we got married at 27, had our first child at 28. So we have two boys now, uh, the eldest is 10 years old and the youngest is seven. Um, again, my wife is Hungarian, uh, Russian. So her, her, her mother is Russian, but her dad is Hungarian, but they're Hungarian by passport and kind of like their houses in Budapest and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, yeah, then they have a dad who's British Lebanese. And so they have, uh, <laughs> I also joke that my, I have, I have two boys with two different passports. Imagine they have two nationalities, two different nationalities. Cause my my eldest was born in Budapest, and because I was not born in the UK, I can't pass on my passport to him, unless we both live there together and there's a kind of thing. Yeah, it's so it's so strange. So he's Hungarian, and then my youngest one was born in London, so he's British. Uh, so the, there's there's that dynamic in the EU. house where I mean, Brexit changes everything. I used to joke. I used to joke with my wife. I'm like, why would they keep? Why would they get the Hungarian passport? What if? What if Hungary gets kicked out of the EU? Like this was before. <laughs> and then it's the UK that gets kicked out. Oh, it's terrible, man. Yeah, it's well, give, give Victor Orban time. Maybe he will get kicked out. We'll see. He's great. He's, he's been, he's, he's president <laughs> he's of like, European Council or something. Oh wow! Oh, he won. I didn't know he won. It, it, it's Hungary. Season. Hungary's rotating turn to to run the presidency. Oh, wow. That's that's awesome. They're actually there now. They're in Budapest right now. So I'm going to go see them the first week of August. All right. Well, you, you can um, see what the feeling is on the street. Um, nice. So I like how, do you, how do you manage? I mean, there's in my mind, there's Brinks is, or Brink is Hong Kong in my mind. But here you are yeah, yeah, yeah. operating. Um, so our main office, our main office here is in Bahrain, actually. So we have around Bahrain, 20 people okay. in Bahrain. Yeah. So that's where the back office is. That's where there's an, you know, they have a physical office the, uh, in Bahrain. Um, and then here we kind of, we're like nomads in a sense that we work out of Let's Work, this app. Um, so we're about eight people here uh, working on different programs, but it is kind of, you know, remote. We don't have an office here. The office is in Bahrain. I guess we'll have Tech Tuesdays in Bahrain soon. Yeah, definitely. Why not? Um, oh, yeah. so what, what, what's your, we're coming up on the hour. What, what's your vision for the next few years? What do you see for yourself, the region, your programs, your initiatives? Yeah, I think, uh, on a personal level, I think you and I are very aligned and, uh, I love what I've seen you from the beginning, kind of push your content, uh, uh, strategy. So I, I completely agree that that's the way forward. So I've dedicated my next two years to just building an online uh, you know, just working on my brand, my personal brand, I would say. So that's something that you're going to see more of me. 
uh, more in short-term forms. We're going to be doing a lot of this pushing to call me and just getting more experts on there. So that's on a personal note, my next two years is just doing content, as much content as I can. Um, and then getting call me to become the number one uh, platform in the region for mentorship. That's something that's also in the books. Uh, and for Brink, we set up a new angel list syndicate, which is ex very exciting. So we're now building out an angel list. Um, getting all these amazing angels together around the world uh, to come in. We close our first deal uh, with Galley, which is one of our portfolio companies. And angels can come and sign up to the syndicate and they can invest up to $1,000. They can choose on the deals that they like. They choose choose not to invest or to invest. And so we're going to be pushing uh, that as well and a lot of content around that. So you'll see uh, me and Bashar, uh, a colleague as well, to kind of really push the angel list syndicate and just kind of build a network of angels to, to invest in amazing deals that we get because of the uh, relationships that we've built over the years with the portfolio companies that we have. And, you know, we're just really picking the best of the best. So I think that's the next two years, I would say, I can't go <laughs> beyond that, is uh, is that, is, is building Call Me, Brink Angel List, and uh, content. Wow. You, you get your high energy, my friend. I love it, man. It's fun. It's uh, it's great. You're also high energy. I've seen you on on stage. You're fantastic. You're so natural. I always say whenever I do Who stage, shows this? I'm interviewing you. Come on. <laughs> whenever I do stage work, I always get a little bit like, do you get do you get nervous at all? Anything or are you just is that you just? just you know, going... I, I, I talked about this this morning, and I, I've said this on I've said this on a recorded format before, so it's nothing new. The um, I grew up with. I'd say nearly crippling social anxiety just for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons, plus a speech issue. I wouldn't call it a full on stutter, but it was definitely a thing. And there's residuals of it now. You know, you can hear it a little bit in the speed I speak, or sometimes I swallow my words. Of course, it's nothing like it was before. And so I worked really, really hard to overcome my fear of public speaking. It, it, you know, everyone's always afraid of it, but I was, it was so bad that when it was my turn to speak in a networking group, I would have like an anxiety attack. But I gradually worked on it. And when I discovered blockchain and crypto in 2014, I went back into the practice of law because of it. I realized that I, I, it was not enough to simply lessen the anxiety. I realized I needed to become as much of a master of public speaking as I could be. So I really just push myself to the other side. And now if I feel adrenaline, it's like fun roller coaster adrenaline or first kiss with a new love adrenaline. It's not, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's like it's like it's like fun danger adrenaline. Now, if you put me, you know, if it's my own event and I'm on, and I'm on the stage and someone I invited, you know, there's barely there's nothing really. There's at this point, I, I just am having fun. If you put me in a room full of 100, 1,000 serious Saudis who aren't smiling and are just looking at me, <laughs> I can do it. I've done that now, but I'll, I'll feel something. And yeah. but and, and and I'll also adjust my communication strategy. Like I, I try to use some slightly aggressive humor when I'm on the stage here and, and running shows, just because it's a little bit different. But you know, I, I calibrate. If I'm a room full of diplomats, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna throw shade. I'm, just, you know, I, I, I'm never mean, but you know, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of conscientiously kind of slow down, slow down, stick with protocol, whatever. But someone, someone who knows me very well said that Gordon, you know, the, when you're the most straight is when you're the most funny, because I understand exactly what you're saying. Like the subtitles, <laughs> they don't. But it's, it's like it's like an adult person watching a Disney film. You're watching a completely Absolutely. different film than your kids, right? Because you, you get all the jokes <laughs> that the animator stuck in there. Yeah, like, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. That's what Simba's doing. <laughs> you know, so, you know, Absolutely. Anyway, for, for what it's worth. But yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I think the building personal brand thing is effective. I, I think it works really well to, to, to your point, because I think it's, you're saying this point you also. I think it works really well when you have an execution structure built around it. Because it's nice to be famous. It's nice to have an impact. It's nice to be recognized, but then you need to do something with it. Because there's a lot of yeah. people that build networking groups and, okay, now they have the networking group. Yay, good for them. Um, I don't think you have that issue Maybe. because I, you, you seem like an operations kind of executions kind of guy. 
right? So you're someone who started with that, now going into content and fame, as was the fame trying to backfill in the ability yeah, to so do something yeah. with it. Yeah, it's just commitment, right? Like I'm, it's commitment. Well, you know, nowadays, if, if you have a native ability to organize things and getting done, it, it feels yeah, like yeah. it just needs to be commitment. For someone who doesn't have that ability or where it's new, it does. It's more like commitment. You get you. They either need to bring someone on board who knows how to do it, or they need to learn something new. Absolutely. For you, it's just commitment because you know what you're doing. I or 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 it looks like I do, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I enjoy I, 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 it. I, listen, you, they, you think I let anyone on the show? I enjoy just it. Anyone? No, you're. I mean, you know, yeah. I'll get up biblical. <laughs> you're one of the chosen people. Okay. <laughs> I'm so, so glad we had this chat. It's been a long time coming, a really a long uh, time coming. It's fun. Uh, and I want you at Tech Tuesdays and I'll get you on the stage. You're, you're great. Yes, yes, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, this is my buddy, Mr. Kareem Bana. And I'm going to publish this video out of order just to get him keep this fresh. Normally there's a few week wait, but I'm going to push it out in the next few days just because it's good, man. It's good. All right, stop the recording. Thanks everyone. Thank you, sir.